My name is Jeff Denworth. I haven't done one of these for uh, eight years, actually. I was at Tech Field Day number <coughs> eight, I believe, um, in my previous role at a company called Data Direct Networks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having us today. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the use cases, because we're talking about um, world domination in some respects. and. Um, we want to bring it down to what's practical today uh, by explaining to you uh, some of the things that we're doing. So I'm just going to talk through some of the use cases that people are working with uh, on us today, and I'll get into it. So, um, so as, as we intimated, there are three ways um, that we let customers buy our product today. One is kind of a black box appliance. We have a lot of customers that say, just roll your, roll your whole solution in here, and, and you guys handle all of it, handle the support, handle the configuration. Uh, and we're very happy to do that. Uh, High density enclosures and standard Linux servers uh, coupled with NVMe networking, uh, NVMe over fabrics networking in cases where people want us to solve that problem as well. Um, the second case and one that I'll talk about in a moment is where customers are now just starting to put our software on their compute infrastructure. Uh, we're completely abstracted away from the hardware layer where we run our software. We're totally stateless. We're containerized, so that's very easy. Um, the third case is one where we can, we can absolutely go software only. Uh, we are working with a few customers that speak in terms of exabytes. Um, and uh, these projects, uh, the customers almost always have a, a supply chain that's at least equivalent to ours. Um, and they're focused on um, building a system that works towards their operational agenda as well. And maybe they have some custom hardware. Now, Renan was talking about the difference between the appliance experience and the software-defined experience. Uh, our belief is that these new types of flash drives that are emerging into the market that need to be written to in multi-gigabyte chunks and um, have variable erase block sizes, if we're going to build an erase block aligned uh, distributed storage system that is optimized for how these drives specifically work, we have to qualify them. So that's an effort on our <coughs> It's not like you can just take any storage software, throw it on top of some QLC drives, and expect that'll work. There needs to be real mindfulness of what the geometry of that drive is. So those projects tend to be large because they justify the, in, the investment. Um, these are the configurations that we have today, four servers in uh, 2U, uh, and then a very high density enclosure, uh, 100 gigabit ethernet or InfiniBand that comes out of the back of it. And um, you can scale these both completely independently. OK. So back to practicality. World domination is our goal, but um, we, we do, uh, yeah, every day we wake up and want to take over the world. Um, but we've been fortunate to work with a number of different customers across a number of different uh, both vertical markets and application disciplines that have helped us figure out if we have something here that can really hunt. Um, we find ourselves in the early days particularly focusing on places where you find the combination of performance and capacity. Uh, and customers that are fairly forward thinking, that comes along with being a startup. But uh, in particular, customers that um, think that they basically want to kill the hard drive as part of their infrastructure. And so that's how we think of ourselves, as just scalable infrastructure that you can start to build applications on. Renan said earlier that we don't believe in backup. We don't believe in backup systems as being some additional tier of infrastructure that you need to buy. Of course, you need to implement backup policies and data management policies, and there's great software for that. But you don't need to ship that out to some other more expensive system in order to implement your backup agenda, in our opinion, as long as you can get to the resilience goals and as long as you can build an architecture that can support the consolidation of all of these different applications onto one platform. So we're working with a lot of the new big data tools uh, as well as AI tools. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we are working as well with a number of the enterprise backup software products that people know and love today. I'm going to walk you through a case study there. Uh, and then we also have vertical practices where customers maybe aren't using commercial codes and things like that. They're rolling their own software. They're using open source utilities. Uh, this is in the life sciences space. Uh, a lot of hedge funds are deploying our product today, um, not only on the creation of content side, meaning like um, film production and rendering, but also on the distribution, everything from video on demand delivery to um, some of the cable operators and how they're pushing out content uh, in the cloud DVR. And then finally, um, uh, high performance computing. And the really cool thing here is that one of the trade-offs that we're breaking is this idea that you need to have a lot of different types of storage to satisfy the different applications that you have in your environment. 
Um, scale is absolutely an important part of that equation because if you're going to build a system that can consolidate a bunch of stuff, it has to be scalable. Composability is a big important part of that because um, some of these applications require dedicated performance. And when Renan was talking about taking our containers and composing them and allocating them to specific applications, then you have that cloud model that you were talking about earlier, but you can give dedicated performance to specific users. So um, that's what we're focused on. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have three customers um, as part of our, our launch. Uh, these are organizations that said, yeah, you know, we've seen the future with Vast and we're happy to jump on board. Um, Ginkgo Bioworks is a crazy company. They're a, um, a startup that's valued at over a billion dollars. They, they're in Boston, they create microorganisms. <coughs> Um, they consider themselves a unicorn, the only unicorn that can create a unicorn. Um, and so they're using gene sequencing as part of their, uh, uh, as part of their pipeline to make all of these new microorganisms, and um, that's being powered by VAST. Uh, Zebra Medical is another great example. This is an organization that's using AI to um, augment the patient care process such that you can have computers now look for things in CT scans and MRIs as opposed to people. And so they're trying to increase the accuracy of results and um, make the patient care process more, more efficient. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about their use case. Uh, General Dynamics, the largest federal IT integrator in the country, um, went on record saying they're, they're happy to be delivering petabyte class systems to their customers already. Uh, General Dynamics had us as part of their emerging technology program. Um, they ship pretty much exclusively to US government customers. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, a, a few use cases, uh, the first of which is AI. Um, as I'm sure you all know, there's these fancy new computers out there uh, that are very hungry beasts. They have um, more I.O. ports on a single server than you typically find, particularly in a two, three year form factor. Um, the DGX1 is a $120,000 system list price. Uh, with a, a very ravenous appetite for data. Um, these machines want to randomly read, uh, back to the, the original name of the company, data into them as fast as possible. Um, there's a bigger system. The big brother of that system has 800 gigabit Ethernet ports coming out of the back of it. Um, this is even more ravenous. And the question is, how do you keep these things fed in a modern world? Well, first, we're a big proponent of the fact that you have to have flash. Um, oftentimes, the accesses to these um, files in the system are very small. People think they're video. Um, they're not reading video in a lot of cases. They're reading images. And sometimes these images can be quite small. So it's a lot of random I.O. that's happening off of the storage network um, into these systems. Uh, they have little SSDs inside of them. But the problem is uh, one of parallelism. You have uh, a lot of different new algorithms that are essentially distributing load across a lot of of these GPU systems. Um, this is a utility that Uber created called Horovod um, that basically <coughs> creates a massively parallel requirement um, in the AI space. Uh, and obviously, that then leads to uh, customers saying to us, well, we don't want to keep all of our namespace in every one of these servers. We need a distributed uh, namespace to support it. So um, the two ways that you can approach solving this problem today up until VAST is you can look at it from the classic NAS perspective. Um, and um, here we find two potential um, big issues. Uh, the first is that NFS as a, as a protocol is inherently point to point, and it's TCP based. So um, what happens is that you may have something in the order of uh, 400 gigabit or um, 800 gigabit of I.O. going into these GPU servers, but you're only going to be able to talk to them at around 16 gigabits per second or 2 gigabytes a second because of the TCP limits and the single threadedness of NFS. And so um, the customers that have realized this and realized they want to keep their GPUs um, much more active, they've looked towards uh, HPC file systems, and then they start to try to do different things like tiering their data off to um, very high capacity object stores. That becomes a, an integration complexity. Uh, and it also, at times, can add a lot of cost because um, the SSD products in both cases haven't been optimized for cost in the way that we have. And so, um, so we have two approaches that we uh, introduce <coughs> to customers based upon their requirements. Uh, in one case, as Renan mentioned, we do have support for NFS over RDMA. Even though it's still a single threaded operation, we can get data into these GPU servers at 5 to 10 gigabytes a second. We don't care about TCP, even though it's a remote transfer over the network. And so in a lot of cases, that's good enough, particularly if customers have um, just a few GPUs in their servers. For some of the bigger ones, 
This statelessness, this containerization that we've built into our architecture allows us to go one step further and publish NVMe over Fabric's performance right into that machine. And so at that point, the I.O. that goes off of the system is parallel NVMe over Fabrics. It's super fast, but the application just sees NFS, or they just see S3. It's the simplest way to access a system with the performance that you couldn't get with classic NAS. Uh, and that's why Zebra, uh, when I'm record, <coughs> excuse me, when I'm record, saying they're working with us because they wanted something that was faster than NFS, but they couldn't deal with the integration complexities of building their own um, complex collection of systems. Um, the other cool thing about Zebra, uh, we're talking a lot about unstructured data, but I'm a big believer in vast as infrastructure. Uh, as Renan mentioned, the same considerations around protocols don't exist when you can access a remote or a, um, a micro file server uh, NFS experience that's under a millisecond. And so um, I sat down with Zebra when uh, they, they were actually our first tester. Uh, and, and a little bit more than a, a year later, they came back and said, yeah, we'll take one of those. Uh, it was really gratifying. Um, so we sat down with them, and they started to explain uh, their workflow. And it wasn't only that they're running these AI tools. They were also building Kubernetes clusters on top of the system. Like, oh, that's really cool. NFS has been maligned up until now because of the implementations in the market. We view it as just a protocol. And if you can make it fast by getting rid of all the crap between the application server and the actual media, um, then it's good enough, or it's fast enough, or it's vast enough for pretty much everybody. OK, so that's the first. Um, life sciences, uh, the whole goal, uh, as, as Renan mentioned, um, we're working with a lot of the world's largest life sciences centers. It turns out that both the performance and requirements, uh, the performance requirements, and the data reduction <coughs> hurdles that you have to get over, both root back to the same issue, which is that the mutations in our DNA are expressed at a level way under uh, a block size, uh, and what you have are these pipelines that are looking for differences at very, very small levels of granularity. This is the random read use case expressed on data sets that today can be um, anywhere between a few petabytes to we're talking to customers that have hundreds of petabytes of genomic data. Um, so it trips up classic data reduction for the reasons that Renan mentioned, but it's also not friendly to hard drive based media. And so um, we were fortunate enough to be selected for a, a very large project. The customer bought petabytes and petabytes from us. Um, and this is a case where we didn't deliver a single Linux server exposing our file system to them whatsoever. Uh, but rather, we're distributing our containers across 1,900 cores that they have as part of their compute environment. Um, it's at least evidence of the fact that the architecture is scalable to very, very large proportions. Um, and now they don't have this distinction between an archive and, uh, a, a, let's say, a working space or a scratch store in terms of their pipeline. It's just their analytics archive that they're building entirely off of NVMe Flash. Uh, and um, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, now that you've heard the presentation, it doesn't cost them any more than what they paid for their hard disk-based system previously. Um, financial services is a great one. Uh, you have a maybe lot of- I'll interject on that one. Sure. That customer, not only does it not cost them more, they were actually able to use 25% less CPU power to get the same results. And that means that they're not just not paying more, they're saving money on CPU because this system is a lot more efficient. Right. Um, financial services, uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of hedge funds. Um, and what we find is that this space is actually changing quite rapidly. Um, and we're in Silicon Valley. You find a lot of people uh, adapting and uh, evolving a lot of new tools. Um, this also can be found on Wall Street, where tools like AI are now starting to creep into every single part of the quantitative trading flow, as well as to inform research. And so what you have is all this different stuff, all these n different moving parts um, working within the environments. And what we find is that oftentimes uh, what customers are really looking for is the ability to find differences in data at very, very fine granularity, which is a random read problem again. Um, and so add to that some weird AI stuff, customers are saying, well, how do I deal with all of this? Um, we had one customer that bought a very large system from us to start. Uh, and they were just tired of dealing with all of the problems of where to place their data, how to manage their data, how to move their data around different systems within their environment. Um, so this is a multi-petabyte system that we're in the process of delivering now. 
uh, where they're consolidating their HPC file systems and their NAS onto one system. And then once they're done, they start to evolve this. Um, they evolve it in a way where they start to connect up um, via our internal fabric a number of different machines that want direct NVMe access to the namespace. Uh, and then they can also start to build out more enclosures into the system for an archive requirement. Uh, today they need a lot of servers to power the, um, the application load, but as they grow their data in the system, they won't need a proportionate amount of performance as they grow. And so, um, so that's the cool part of the architecture. Uh, today they have just a bunch of NFS clients and um, uh, they'll add GPU servers over time and they'll all be very, very fast. Now, um, what we do find as well is that we have a lot of customers that are now starting to, um, uh, at least in this space, work with cloud providers. Cloud is great because you can burst workloads into it in real time. So people that need to grow their pipelines really quickly, um, they try to respond to it as such. And, um, and what we found is that five milliseconds is the magic number. And uh, we had another customer the other day that just uh, started running a few hundred um, 100 machines against our cluster, but it wasn't even in the same data center. It was a few hundred miles away in a Google data center. And so if you can bring the, the latency of storage down to a point where it's now, um, it's, it's now not punitive, uh, you've got all these hard disk based services within the native cloud providers, you can actually get to a vast system remotely faster than you could get to, let's say, some hard disk based storage system. Okay. so. Um, Renan talked a lot about data protection. Um, I mentioned backup a little bit. We've been working with a few tools. One of those is Commvault. Data reduction. Oh, excuse me, data reduction, I'm sorry. Um, one of those is Commvault. Commvault is one of those systems that already has its own native data reduction tools in it. It has deduplication, uh, it has compression. And so we just took um, some of these, uh, some, some Commvault servers and we started to run some tests. We backed up a bunch of virtual machines with uh, customer business data. We deduplicated that data, and then there were two scenarios following that. Um, in one case, the data was compressed off the Commvault before it got to us. In the other case, it was not. In the case where it was not compressed, what we saw is an additional six to one with our similarity-based data reduction. In the case where they turned compression off, which created a little bit of entropy in the data and made it difficult for us to find similarity, then they got to 20 to one additional data reduction after deduplication. And these all compound. And so this extremely fine-grained approach is a game changer. Um, and we didn't believe it at first ourselves, so we had to go in and look at the actual data. Uh, and we started looking at the bits. And so we started realizing, OK, that 653D is actually over there. And we can start to see that the differences in data are expressed at such a fine level of granularity that no deduplication system could ever stand up to that. And so you need a global view with byte range granularity in order to achieve this. And um, the way that we're storing data down onto disk is such that it's all very, very small um, increments that are being stored. And as uh, Renan mentioned, we go all the way no, down to byte range. If you stored in this way in a hard disk based system, you would completely fragment the drive such that you wouldn't ever be able to read from it. So counterintuitively, the only way to get storage costs under what you pay for hard disks is with flash. And we start to see evidence of this in a lot of different use cases that we're working on. So for Splunk, for example, we're at four to one. Uh, we've got systems at a bunch of animation studios, anywhere between two and a half to four to one. Um, oh, that's actually meant to be virtual machines. We can see around 10 to one. We're working with weather data and new types of microscopes and all sorts of different cases where we're finding opportunity where nobody ever thought it existed. 